Hi, I'm Wayne Jones. Welcome to the Writing and Editing Podcast. This is episode 97, Indie Writing, Music, Filmmaking, and Editing. My guest today is James Knoll, who practices those first three arts and also has a friend who helps him with the fourth one. One of his books is available for free, by the way. He also has been a teacher for the last 20 years. Hi, James. Welcome to the podcast, and thanks for taking the time to uh, talk to me. Right on. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, uh, in a sense, you're a perfect guest for me because I looked through your profile, or one of your profiles anyway, and you mentioned like four bullet things, and I thought, wow, I'm interested in all four of those. So <laughs> this cool. will this this will be good. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to jump right in and and start with indie publishing. Okay. And by the way, I'm happy to see that term coming more to the fore now than self-publishing. It uh, seems it's a better term. Self-publishing has a feeling of vanity publishing about it, which is not it, it is not that anymore at least i don't feel yeah. so uh have ha, first have you published all your books this way yeah yeah um i started indie publishing in 2013 um my first book was just a, a series of short stories like an anthology with a novel at the end of it um but you know in in, in reference to why i refer to it as indie publishing you know i i in college, I played in a lot of bands. I mean, you can see behind me all my music gear and everything. Um, and I've still kept that up. But, you know, in, in the bands that I played in, it was always expected that we do everything ourselves. Like nobody was giving us a budget uh, to record our, our music. Nobody was uh, helping us out with any tour support. And it was completely accepted and everybody loved it. And so when I went from, you know, that particular world to I'm going to start writing my own books, it was it was always weird to me that there was this gatekeeper system that seemed to be held over from the early 20th and late 19th century. When I came from this world where they're like, no, you're doing it yourself. That's awesome. And, and everybody, like you said, they're frowning on on uh, vanity, vanity publishing. And I just I was like, oh, I'm not going to call it vanity publishing. I'm not going to call it self-publishing. It's it's indie. It's it's been accepted and in, in, all of the arts except for publishing for some reason i've got yeah. friends who make a living off of doing art you know and and they they don't call themselves actually they don't call themselves indie artists they call themselves artists you know right um and so that's kind of where i was like well, no it's indie publishing it's fine and, and even back then 2013 it was um it was just coming to the fore i think 2008 is when create space really started making it possible for people to do publish on demand so the amount of money you would have to put into publishing a book was was gone um and so 2013 it was really starting uh, off but now there is a whole ecosystem of of indie publishers indie publishing services it's yep. really taken off as something that is seen as as more and more legitimate and it should it, there's no reason why you should only have one or two gateways to reading something that you want to read especially if it's good stuff it's a good point, and I totally agree with you about the gatekeeper system and the the three issues. I mean, there's and actually there were two gate, two huge gatekeepers. One was uh, first there was the publisher, uh, and often I know from experience, often there was a very long wait to get replies, or sometimes there weren't even entertaining responses or mm -hmm. or queries. And then the other uh, gatekeeper was the literary agent. That was mm -hmm. another one where even though they're a literary agent, it often also often took a long time. So you could have written a novel and it would take you a year and a half to get a no back. You know, right. I mean, that that's not just just not functional. That that can't work like that. Frustrated the hell out of me and yeah. many and many people. And also, I anyway, I'll just put in my little I guess <laughs> dig here is that if out of all that system came fantastic literature all the time maybe i could see yeah okay let's keep them in but there was a lot of crap published too that came from publishers i'm not dissing publishers overall but i believe the system is is uh tectonically changing changing definitely yeah and, uh, and that's not to say that the indie stuff is all perfect it's not yeah you know, I've, I've read plenty of indie books where i'm like mm, this needs you know a layer of this a layer of that it's not to say that all of my books are perfect i love them i, I put them through as much development and copy and line editing as, as as possible but you're right i mean i've read books by by major authors i've read books by stephen king where i'm like man i can't believe they published this of his like this is not at all quality uh or catching you know, little, little uh, grammatical errors in, in books that have been published by major publishers. And so 
the, the point is they're not perfect and it's still a very subjective business. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right, you know, they, they do uh, publish things that are excellent. Of course, there's stuff that comes out when you have that many people who are attuned to what a good book is and what a good writer is and what a good plot is. There's going to be amazing stuff that comes out. Of course, there is. Uh, but it shouldn't be the only pathway to doing it. And there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it. There's the way I was looking at it in terms of just of, of being an artist, of, of putting your stuff out there uh, and having the freedom to do so. Like a lot of my, you know, my oil painting friends, my, uh, my, my friends who work with clay, my friends who, uh, who, who make uh, comic books, um, it, they're doing it because like, you know, there is no system for them to go and put out all that art. So they're doing it themselves. Yeah. Um, but it's also, you can look at it as it's, it's a business. And from the business end, from what I understand, uh, the big publishers, even if you get uh, an advance, even if they publish you, unless you're a big name, unless you're a celebrity author, they're not going to put all that money in the marketing. And so after a while, it, you start to think, so they gave me $15,000 for this book. So I got my advance. Um, some of it might be recoupable, like they used to do with the record industry, or like they still do with the record industry. Uh, and I'm not selling very well because they're not putting any money into the marketing. So I have to do that still. And then when I do that and my book sells, I only get a fraction of the returns. Um, and they don't put a lot of money into mid list. They don't put a lot of money in the back end as well. And so if you look at it from a dis business decision, you go, okay, well, all business is a risk. I'm going to take a risk on my writing. I'm going to take a risk on, on my art um, and start putting it out there on my own and, and get better and do the best job I can. But you're in charge of it all, which is a pro and a con, but you also reap whatever benefits you, you are able to reap. And you start right. figuring out how to market and, and make some money off of it. You're not giving a fraction of that to yourself. It goes yep. all to you. So uh, I also, that was also appealing to me. And I'll, yeah, you you just alluded to it in a little bit, but uh, in a little way. But uh, editorial and creative control—that's that's an awesome thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have any editor saying, "I don't know how much, how, you know, uh, could we get rid of this because it's I don't know politically incorrect or something like that, mm -hmm. or we don't want a character saying this because of whatever reason." You don't need mm -hmm. to do that, right? You control it. Yeah, it's the risk that you take, but it, you know, it's this, at the same time, it's you get to do the thing that you want. I, you know, I, I go back to like the music that I put out with with tons of bands. Um, you know, not all of it was great, but I still got to do it, uh, and I and I did it mm. my way. In terms of uh, some of the, if you're looking at development, one thing that I learned, I, the latest book that I wrote is called Mung Wart, um, and there's a weird backstory to that but, but you know i don't have to go into that the the point of the of the comment is that for the first time i was actually able to work with a a, a partner a writing partner um and we were coming to the storyline from the point of view of making it a script like an indie movie um and so he my friend chip uh writes scripts uh in, in hollywood he's got a podcast uh production company that he's running right now um, so he really helped me lay out this story in a way that I hadn't done before. And the back and forth between he and I really, really made the story better. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when, you know, that was the first time I realized it's like, OK, I like the other stuff that I've done, but this is really, really good. So I can't advocate more for indie authors to find that person. You know, fortunately, I have a friend who do it, who does it You know, more often than not. You're going to have to pay an editor uh, to do something like that. Um, but if you can find that person who's going to work with you on plot development, character development, hitting those beats that readers want to read um, and play those ideas and, and have that type of symbiosis uh, with your creativity, it only elevates the work. And, and I say that uh, because prior to working with Chip, I was like, nope, I'm going to do it all by myself. I don't need any input. Mm -hmm. Now I think I kind of don't want to move forward unless I'm working with Chip or somebody else. This is this was a great uh process it was it, I, I loved every aspect of it um and it just made my work better um yeah so that's another part of the the system system that works really well when you find that really good editor speaking as an editor myself i i i totally happy to hear you say that because if a person especially a beginning person who says wow there's indie publishing and they've never published a book before and they figure they can do it all themselves uh you can't and yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you'll you'll end, you'll end up with a with a book that's poor in one aspect or another, maybe in developmental, maybe in typos, maybe in whatever design. Okay. 
Uh, yep. uh, so yeah, it's got awesome that you have uh, someone like that who knows about those sorts of things. I wanted to ask you a little bit too. I'm always interested in this about uh, any writer is your process. So you've already mentioned a little bit about the back and forth there with your friend or your editor friend, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, just the logistics of how you write. Are you a are you a planner and a scheduler, or do you let the muse move you, move you kind of thing, or are you pretty scheduled? Like, how how do you go about it? Well, I would say at the beginning, especially when I was younger, I was a complete pantser. Uh, you know, it was discovery writer, whatever you want to call it. It's like no. Oh, I'm going to let creativity fly and I'll let this thing go wherever it goes. And, you know, you're, that's, that's very hit, hit or miss way of doing it. Um, what it, that particular process allows for is a lot of freedom and creativity. Just let the thing go where it needs to go. And then you can go back and put some sort of structure over it. Um, as I started teaching more and more, um, and you know, I've been teaching for 21 years and I've got a, I, well, I, I changed counties. I used to teach a creative writing one and two class. Once I started getting into that, I was like, you know, I can't just tell these kids, just write something and expect something to happen. I got to really show them how to do this. Sure. And I started moving more from pantser into, you know, let's let's go right in the middle with planting, I used to call it. Like, you know, set up some sort of arc, set up some sort of plan. Here are all these structures that you learn about. And this is a really good way of looking at it because, you know, when you're pantsing, you might get to the point where you don't know where to go. He's like, oh, I, I already wrote this out. I'm going to try this thing and get back on track a little bit. Um, and then now in working with Chip, I'd say the needle has gone like a little bit more to, you know, 75% planning and 25% pantsing um, <laughs> because that whole, that whole structure and that whole process was, like I said before, just, it was super fun. I, I never had a better time writing a novel before and doing it that way. And the result was so much better than the stuff that I'd, I'd done before. Yeah. The interesting yeah. thing about working with Chip is um, well, here, here's the, the thing I was alluding to before. So I decided in the middle of the pandemic, um, well, it was pre pandemic, I set up a, a short film uh, that was uh, adapted from one of my short stories. Uh, and I'd already gotten all the funding and, and planned it all out, had people coming from LA to act in it and to direct it. And I had the, the whole crew hmm. when the pandemic hit. About mid 2020, we filmed it anyways. Um, and we were, we were done with that. Uh, and the director said, hey, you know, you might be able to get some interest out of this. You should write a script that's like the sequel to this little short so that if anybody ever says, do you, you know, this was good, what else are you going to do with it? You have this, this movie. And so that's when I started working with Chip in earnest. Um, and we planned out this entire indie movie. Uh, it was you know, 90 pages long, 95 pages long and hit, you know, three act structure, hit all the save the cat beats. Um, and then we were also trying to keep it spare. This is indie production. You know, we, we could maybe spend, uh, if we're lucky, if somebody gives us a million dollars, which apparently that's a no budget movie, which is crazy to me. Um, but after doing a short film, I understand why they're super expensive. So mm -hmm. we did this whole thing. And then Chip was like, look, I, you know, the pandemic is starting to, to end. I've got to go back to work. You know, my benefits are running out. And so I, I was looking at this 95 page amazing story that we had. And I said, you know, I'm going to adapt this into a novel. And he's like, yeah, go ahead. Just, you know, give me some credit and, and you're good to go. And that's what happened with Mung War. Um, and that's where my process is now. That's where I've decided I'm going to do it that way from now on is have the script be the first thing that I do um, because it's like this amazing, robust outline. You've, you've got all of the, the salient scenes, everything yeah. you need there. And then you can take it and expand it into this larger novel world. Um, so the first draft of Mung War, it, 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 the, the movie's called I Ain't Gonna Work on Lilith's Farm No More, which I think is a great title. Um, that was maybe 33,000 words when I first adapted it. And I went, okay, well, the novel has to be at least 77 to, you know, 85, 90,000 words. And, and so I added those 40,000, 50,000 words. And, and then uh, uh, looking at that, I was like, oh, look at that. That's, that's why everybody always says I like the book better because the book is just this large, expansive world. And that's where I let my pantsing go crazy. I was like, I'm going to add this. I'm going to add this. You know, I don't have to keep, you know, stick to the structure. I don't have to worry about a budget. Uh, I can add these characters. I can add these crazy things that might need CGI, but, you know, it's my book. I can do whatever I want with it. And again, I loved that process. And so the, the latest sketch that I've done did that. I, I did that with it. I did the act, the three act structure, waiting for Chip to have some time so we can talk about it and flesh it out and then turn that into another novel. 
Yeah, and also what you had uh, when you have when you have a script, of course, you've got the dialogue written, and a lot of people talk about the difficulty writing dialogue. Of course, a movie, a screenplay, uh, will be, you know, what ninety percent dialogue, right? So you've got that done, sort of. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, and and, and you, if you know, in a screenplay, every scene has to have a reason. You, you, there mm -hmm. has to be a meaning for it. There has to be this interplay uh, that results in something that that drives the story forward. So it helps the plot. And it takes out that guesswork that that is always there in the first draft, even the second draft. You're like, do I really need this? This 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 conversation went on for three pages. Why is it three pages long? Well, in a script, you're forced to kind of condense these things. Uh, so, like I said, it's you know a script is an outline for a novel in the way that I'm doing it. So I can expand that scene if I wanted to, or I can keep it nice and tight and controlled and, and move on through the story that way. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Uh, I want to ask you too, uh, two things related. You already mentioned to you about the teaching that you do and for a long time, actually. Um, first, I guess, where do you find the time to either pants or plants, whichever one you're <laughs> going with? And the other one is, is there anything about the teaching? You, you, I think if I caught you right, you said that at one time you used to do like uh, creative, you know, actually be teaching creative writing, but mm -hmm. I get the impression now you're you're simply teaching not those subjects is that right yeah well i mean it's public school i i, I live yeah. in virginia um in terms of the time you know you have to make the time um as i've gotten older it's it's more difficult uh even though my kids are out of the house right now you know i, I get home from work and i'm tired um but when i am working on stuff uh, be it during the school year or over the summer when i have a little bit more time I, i've got to find another job over the summer to, to make up for the, the lack of a paycheck um I I schedule the time to do it. Morning is the best for me to be creative. My brain is fresh. Um, I can uh, I can get out the amount of words that I want to get out for whatever it is that I'm writing. Uh, if it's um, if I'm making the adaptation from a script to a novel, it's a thousand words a day, uh, and you can actually plan out like, oh, well, this is a ninety thousand word uh, story, so it's going to take me. 90 days to, to get this done uh, right. I'll give myself or you know and that's give or take some days I'll get 500 in sometimes I'll get a thousand five hundred in that seems to be my limit I mean there's been a few times where I've gotten two thousand in I'm not sure about the quality of those words um but I'll, I'll make sure that like that's when I'm doing it um when I was teaching creative writing I, I would do that with my students I would write with my students all the time because I told them I was like I'm not going to grade during this class I'm not going to classroom management you guys to death when you guys are writing short stories, I'm going to be writing stuff from whatever projects I'm going to do. And I treated that class like a workshop. And so uh, yeah. that did a couple of different things. It, it it made me adjust my writing to a more general audience, which can be good or bad. But I decided, well, you know, I, I write science fiction, horror fiction, combinations of the two, maybe a little bit of dark fantasy in there. Um, and I thought, well, you know, this is a a captive audience i'm not going to freak anybody out with anything and putting some of those parameters and the amount of like blood and gore that i was going to put actually made the writing better because it made me focus not on the the, the climactic moment of like oh my god this character was killed it was like but in order for that to matter you have to care about the characters and you have to build suspense and so i'm going to focus more on character development and the the, the moments leading up to whatever death is going on uh, because of that captive audience and lo and behold I was like oh this is this is a much better product than yeah. uh, when I was just going free with that um but yeah now that I'm uh, in a different county um I'm, I'm I'm an English teacher when I was teaching creative writing in in the first county where I was working I was also teaching AP English and English 11. Uh, I had five different preps now I have two different preps in this different county still AP English still English 11. um but uh, somebody else in this school is, is doing creative writing and I'm actually okay with it. I was starting to get burned out on doing the workshop uh, for, you know, for 19 yeah. years. Change um, is always good. Change is good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've got the same curriculum for the other classes. I can focus on that. That's my J-O-B. It's, you know, it's what pays the bills. It gives me health care. Uh, I still like teaching. I still like the kids. Um, but uh, in terms of creativity, um, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll come home and Chip always makes fun of me for this, but I was like, I got to take a nap. I'm, I've been up since 515. I get home. I got about a 45 minute to an hour commute. I come home. I'll take about an hour long nap. And if I'm whatever creative thing I'm doing, I can do about one of those things. So if it's writing, I'll whatever stage of writing in, I'll do that uh, and I'll schedule that time out um, and make sure that I get to the gym when I need to get to the gym or go to my soccer game. 
Um, right now, I'm, I, I finished a sketch for that novel and the script. So I'm writing an album instead. Um, and that's, mm. I, I love going back and forth between those two creative uh, uh, juices, I guess, because writing an album has similarities to writing a novel, but it's not the same thing. I get to play with all my stuff. <laughs> uh, I love the technical aspect of it. It's, it's something I've always done and it gives me a break from constantly being in that literary world. I'm gonna go do this for a little while and let those ideas for a new book you know, uh, formulate while I'm doing other things. And usually by the time I'm done writing and recording an album, I'm tired of doing that and I wanna go back to writing a novel. So it's, it's, it's this nice little creative uh, mixing up. That's really good. And it's still, if you think of you know, creativity as having muscles, you're still exercising them, but uh, you, you're you're doing legs one day and uh, or a chest the next day. Kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And man, man you, to be uh, that organized, I used to, I'm now retired actually. So I have uh, the time to work on the, the passions that I have. Uh, writing is one of them. And uh, but when I was working, I had the same thing you had, where when I'd come home, I mean, I didn't have a, like, I wasn't shoveling ditches all day. I was uh, worked as a, in the university library, but you're okay. mentally tired, you know, you're mentally tired. And I didn't have the, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that you could imagine that you could do a thousand words. I, I wrote, <laughs> I, wrote I wrote novels based on writing about 250 words a day. And so they would take about a year and a bit, but uh yeah. I knew I couldn't do it just by waiting for some silly muse to tap me on the shoulder. I needed to do, I needed to be rigorous about it. And uh, it works. I mean, eventually all those add up, right? And you have a yeah. novel. So, yeah. yeah. I think it was, it was either Toni Morrison or Maya Angelou would, when she was first starting writing, she was the same thing. It's like, I didn't care if I got five words in or a thousand. I wrote until the thing was done. Um, and that's one of those disciplines I picked up, not just from teaching students, um, but from like you said, it's like, I just wanted to get this done. And the only way to do it is to do it. And the next thing you know, it becomes, like you said, it's muscle memory. All right, I'm gonna sit down. Uh, some people have to do it at the same time every day for the same amount of time. I, I don't necessarily need that. I try to do it in the morning, but if that doesn't work, I'll do it in the evenings. Um, and your your body goes okay. It's time to do this, and then you go, you go get it done. But again, like you said, I mean, if I you know even after an hour long nap, which that's there's there's scientific evidence. I looked it up. I was like, am I being lazy or is this okay? They're like, no, this is good for creativity. You know, you mm -hmm. want burst of energy, take a ten minute nap. You want to have you know enough money to you know button click your way through the end of the day, take a thirty minute nap. You want to be creative, hour long to an hour and a half. And I'm like, good. Um, but sometimes even after that, it's just. And I was like, no, I'm fried. I'm done. I've been explaining things to people all day long. I do not want to discuss anything. I don't want to describe anything. Yeah. I don't want to be creative at all. But I'm going to do 100 words. Uh, I'm going to, and sometimes 100 will be like, all of a sudden it's 500. Um, and so really it is, it's, it's, it's like, like you mentioned before, it's like going to the gym. You might not want to do it and you get there and your body goes, oh yeah, and then you do it. Yeah, no, that's very good. That's that's pretty good. Uh, I mean, you're you're describing something that's uh, I wouldn't call it chaotic, but the, there's a lot of stuff going on. But there's mm -hmm. a certain there's a there's a through line of discipline in in what you're saying. Otherwise, yeah. you'd have no books or you'd have no music or no albums, right? Yeah. yeah. And it was at one point in my life I was working as a bartender, and the owner was a friend of mine. And on my breaks, I would go and read or write. And this was, you know. These were long shifts. I'd start off as a waiter at four in the afternoon. And then there was a transition around 10 when the bands would come in. Uh, and I was a bartender all of a sudden at that point. Uh, but, you know, we got our 15, 20 minute breaks um, and there was no place in this uh, in, in this restaurant to go outside. So I just sit in the corner and read or or I'd write. I'd sketch out ideas or do drafts. And the owner would come up. She's like, what are you doing? She's like, this is amazing watching you. Like there's this this punk rock band's playing up in the corner. Like, how do you tune it out? And I was like, at that time I had kids. I was like, well, I got three kids, so I can tune out anything. Um, <laughs> but it really is, like you said, it's about the discipline of doing it and, and making sure you just get it done. Um, my my friend Bill Harris is an artist here uh, where I live in Fredericksburg. I asked him sometimes, like, don't you ever feel like you know, like I don't want to do this? He's like, yeah, but I just go, I stand up, and I go into my studio and I pick up my brush. And he's like, it doesn't matter what happens after that. Whatever I got done, I I moved the the needle forward. I got the next ten yards towards the touchdown. Um, and I love the way that he described that. So I will go and pick up the drumsticks, pick up the guitar, 
sit in front of the, the word processor and go, it doesn't, I'm already here. Now, now I have to do it. It's like walking into work and saying, well, now I got to work. <laughs> and then right. you do it. Yeah, no, it's all, I've heard that actually, you probably heard the old one about writing that, how do you write a book? Well, you sit down in front of a computer. That's how you write a book. Yeah, <laughs> one word at a time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey man, this has been a really fun interview. Thank you and and informative. I'm, and you. I'm glad to see, I'm glad that you've justified the sometimes one hour naps that I take during the day. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're, they're brilliant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take care. Take it easy. Bye. And that's all for this episode. If you'd like to subscribe or contact me or find out more, please visit writingediting.ca. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again soon.